So thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, welcome everyone to the second RC intros event uh, featuring a panel of our RC faculty. My name is Logan Corey. I'm the Director of Admissions and Recruitment in the Residential College and I'm excited and grateful for the opportunity to connect with you about the Residential College during this more distanced and difficult time. I'm also a proud alumna of the RC and the UM College of Literature, Science and the Arts and I want to congratulate all of you who have received your accepted admissions to U of M and welcome you into a community of Michigan Wolverines. As a reminder, this event is being recorded and will be available on our website and YouTube pages in the coming days. As an attendee of this event, you will not have access to your camera or your microphone, but you are encouraged to write any questions you have about the RC for our panelists in the Q&A. So feel free to drop those in the Q&A anytime during the event. To start, I'll share a brief overview of the RC, then I'll ask our faculty panelists to turn on their videos and introduce themselves. And I'd also like to note that my colleague, Aisha Biswas, who is the RC Student Affairs Coordinator, is also here to help answer some questions in the Q&A. So to kick things off, we'll begin with that brief overview of the Residential College. So to think about the RC, it might be helpful just to think about where we are physically when we're here on campus. So if you note the block M in the top corner, that's where we are, right on central campus, and a short walk from uh, the Diag, Michigan Union, a lot of those key pieces and places of central campus at Michigan. Of course, most of our opportunities are virtual right now, which really means the RC is wherever our students are, wherever they need us to be. And if you're thinking about the RC within the College of Literature, Science and the Arts within the University of Michigan, we're a small slice of the entire student population. And by keeping our community small and admitting up to 250 students in each incoming class, that ensures that we have a close, tight-knit community, that students get a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with our faculty members, and they're really able to take advantage of those opportunities that we have to offer our students. And there's a lot that goes into the RC student experience. I'll touch on a few of the key uh, pieces here, but I really encourage you to explore more of the information on our website, especially our RC podcast. And there you can hear directly from faculty, students, alumni, staff members about what the RC is and what we have to offer. So first I'll touch on our faculty and advising. A really wonderful feature of the RC is your academic advising. So your academic advisor is actually an RC faculty member. So that may mean you might have already had them in an RC class. You might bump into them in the halls in East Quad. So it's a little more comfortable when you get to know them. RC courses are a very unique feature here on campus. And if for a key piece, they're much smaller than other courses you may find. RC courses typically have about nine to 20 students in the classroom. Again, that means you will have a lot of that one-on-one -on -one interaction with your instructor. The RC is also known for our community outreach. For some students, that might mean taking your language skills to the next level by really getting involved in the community, maybe in ESL tutoring. For other students, that might mean getting more involved in programs like the Semester in Detroit program or the Prison Creative Arts Project. And I want to mention a little bit the importance of RC physically in E-Squad. There's a lot of unique features you'll find within the walls there. Everything from the last darkroom found anywhere on campus, to a theater, to a ceramic studio, a printmaking studio, we have a student kitchen. A lot of these really unique features that help make eSquad home to so many RC students. And the RC community is a really rich part here with our student life opportunities. So for many students, that will mean going to events that are hosted by their RAs, the resident advisors, things like going to the orchard in the fall or going ice skating at Yost Arena in the winter. And a lot of that will also mean doing some of our student clubs. For example, there's RC forums, which are similar to a discussion course in that you can earn one credit for participating, but they operate more like a club for students in that they'll meet in the evenings, put on community-wide events, and range in topics from health and wellness to feminist to uh, diversity in politics. Now I'll touch a little bit on some of the RC academic requirements. For an RC student, they still maintain their status as an LSA student. Well, that means that you have both LSA and RC academic requirements. Conveniently, most of those RC requirements overlap with pre-existing LSA requirements, meaning you can fulfill them with just sometimes one course and really save time and save money in the long run. So to start, probably the most well-known RC requirement is the language proficiency program. For LSA students, you are working towards 16 credits. For RC students, you're working towards 20, which really means one additional course. 
but as a nice feature, RC students typically complete that requirement in half the time it takes their LSA peers due to the structure of our semi-immersion language program. The next requirement, the first year writing seminar, is common at a lot of colleges and universities to help you integrate your writing skills, really figure out what level you need to be at for that college standard. For the RC first year writing seminar, a great feature is for those RC honor students. You can take our course and still fulfill your honors requirement for that first year writing course. Our art practicum course is a great opportunity, I like to say, to keep into your schedule something you love in high school that maybe you're not going to major in. That could be a drama course, that could be a ceramics course, or to add something into your schedule you've always wanted to try, maybe darkroom photography, maybe Afro-Cuban drumming. And then we have one additional academic requirement beyond these. This is our four RC course requirement. This means that you should take four additional RC courses, any semester, any topic, any number of credits before you graduate. I like to say it's a good way to guarantee you'll have an RC course in your schedule each semester you're here on campus, and a good way to guarantee you're going to have a smaller course. So maybe you're going from a 500 student lecture to a 10 student RC course to help balance out your schedule. Our final requirement is non-academic and it's the residential requirement. For this requirement, typically RC students live within eSquad their first and second years on campus. And I will add that due to COVID, we have relaxed this requirement a little bit. So this was not required for our students that are currently enrolled. And we have not yet made a final announcement how this will work for our incoming students. So keep an eye out on our website, keep an eye out for emails from me, giving you more information about that requirement for the fall. And I just wanted to touch briefly on our application timeline for admissions in the RC. Most of you have already completed those first few pieces. You've been admitted to LSA, you may have confirmed your interest in the RC, and now you're looking to see about securing your spot. So for that, you would need to first confirm your interest, and then second, a pay your enrollment deposit to U of M. And we admit first come, first serve for students who have completed those two steps. There's no additional essay, no additional interview process. It's entirely determined by you picking us and us having that capacity to support you and your interests here at Michigan. And I know that that can cause some stress and anxiety, especially if you're navigating multiple options, you're waiting to hear back from financial aid. So for all of that, I would encourage you to reach out to me directly. I try to be very transparent about our admissions process. I'll let you know if we're getting close to a wait list where you may stand. So just stay in good communication with me and I'll help you find the best option for you in the RC. And to go along with that, here's my contact information. So feel free to copy any of this down, a phone, email, any of those are fine. And also keep an eye out for one additional RC intro event we have planned right now, where you'll be able to connect with some of our RC alumni. So thank you for indulging me with a little bit of an overview of the RC. I know for some of you that may be a recap if you're really familiar with us. For anyone that's new, I hope that helped answer some of your general questions you may have. Now I'd like to welcome the RC faculty panelists to turn on their videos for some introductions before we jump into some questions. I have a few questions I've prepared that I'd like to ask all of you, then we'll start taking some questions shared by our audience in the Q&A. So again, feel free to type your questions there at any point during the presentation. So we'll go in alphabetical order of first name for our faculty panelists, and then I'd like you to share your name, your pronouns if you'd like to share them, which department you teach in, RC, anywhere else on campus, and how long you've been teaching in the RC. And I believe first that would take us to Catherine. Thank you, and thank you all very much for attending. I hope to meet many of you in the fall. Uh, my name is Catherine Badgley. I teach in the Residential College Science Program. My pronouns are she, hers. I also teach in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I am a natural scientist, and you might have seen from my, um, my kind of still photograph that I'm actually a paleontologist, so I'm out there digging up fossils in the Mojave Desert. And um, I've been teaching at the residential college for more than 30 years, and I love the place. There. Um, I'm Heather Thompson and pronouns she, hers, and I am in the RC. I'm also in the history department and in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies. 
And let's see, I've been in the RC um, a couple of different times because I've been at Michigan a couple of different times, but most recently and most permanently since 2015. And uh, I am in the RC in the social theory and practice program, but I also direct the crime and justice minor. And so if you were to take classes with me, you would take classes most likely on policing or prisons or having to do with civil rights or maybe uh, city of Detroit. Um, and, uh, and I am always interested also in um, projects in the social theory and practice uh, program, which you'll hear more about. There's uh, various ways to major in the RC, um, also minor in the RC and I'm happy to talk with anybody about that as well. And next we have Jeff. Okay, hi, I'm Jeff Evans. I am uh, he, his, and uh, I'm in the social theory and practice program and the science program and the first year seminar program. Um, I'm a psychologist and primarily a clinical psychologist, but also a neuropsychologist uh, and have worked at the hospital here, U of M Hospital, uh, retiring a few years ago, and now I'm just uh, teaching at the RC. Um, and I've been here since the uh, mid 70s, 1970s, so uh, quite a while, maybe <laughs> even longer than Catherine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And next, that brings us to John. Hi, everybody. I'm John Wells, and I am a former director of the RC, so uh, I consider it to be the coolest place on campus. Uh, so for those of you who have made a, a decision to come to the RC, it was uh, probably the best decision uh, you've made in a while. And uh, for those of you who are still waiting to decide, uh, let me encourage you strongly to consider uh, the RC. It is uh, one of the most lively um, vigorous, interesting, uh, friendly place in a campus that, of course, uh, is very large and can even sometimes uh, appear impersonal. So the RC is uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I joined the RC in 2014, and um, I'm a historian of 19th century America. So the classes I teach are mostly African-American history in the 19th century, the Civil War, uh, and the American South. Hi all, um, my name is Kate Mendeloff and um, I go by she, hers, she, her, hers. Um, I am teaching in the drama program, which was one of the original concentrations in the RC. And actually when it was founded, there was a semi-professional theater company that was associated with it, the Brecht Company. So uh, work um, that was influenced by or written by the great German playwright Berthold Brecht. Um, it, I am a teacher in this program uh, because I would say it brings together the two things I care most about, dramatic literature and um, performance, particularly uh, directing. And so our program believes that you cannot understand a play without performing it. So all of our classes have a substantial production element in them. And we have our own theater as Logan mentioned. We have the Keene Theater, which is a 150 seat theater right in East Quad. And um, so it's wonderful. Every class that I do, we get on our feet and we explore the plays that we're reading and discussing uh, through embodying them, becoming the people, understanding the context in which the play was written, how that uh, context relates to us in our contemporary time. 
And um, some of my recent courses have focused on contemporary American plays about race. And um, that, you know, those classes have been very, very interesting. But I also teach a number of classes on um, American drama and on Greek drama and Victorian drama and, um, and um, recently uh, this semester, uh, because we are virtual, I've been teaching the work of Samuel Beckett and Harold Pinter, uh, who can work very well in Zoom boxes, I have found. Um, so you can major in drama in collaboration with courses in the theater department over on North Campus, or you can minor in drama, or you can just take drama courses. I'm also the artistic, I'm sorry, the faculty supervisor for RC Players, our theater company that's located right in the RC that's open to all. And I'm also artistic director of Shakespeare in the Arb, which is a summer theater staging Shakespeare's plays in the 120 acre arboretum on campus. No stage, the audience follows the action into the woods. And so it's a great way to get some exercise <laughs> and to play with Shakespeare in a beautiful setting. Thank you, Kate. I always brag about how Shakespeare and the Arb had Romeo and Juliet do the balcony scene in a tree. So using yes. the environment. <laughs> yes. And that brings us to Katri. Hi, everybody. My name is Katri Erwama and uh, her, hers, she, her, hers. Um, I teach music. I'm the music program head and I'm a cello player by trade. Uh, so I, I perform as well as teach. Um, my main topic, I guess, a focus is, is chamber music. And um, so I run anywhere from eight to 22 um, little groups per semester. And then I also teach a foundations of music class and a creative musicianship theory lab, uh, both of which are kind of music theory taught through application, taught through performance and um, experiencing music, just uh, like what Kate was talking about. We believe that you need to both understand the theory and apply it to really hear it. Um, I've been teaching in the RC 18 years now, so I've been around for a little bit. It's a great place to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. And so, like I said, I have a couple questions I prepared I want to throw to the group, and then we'll hear a little bit more from the Q&A. Uh, but one question that I hear a lot when I'm meeting with students or family members is, what is a typical RC course like? So we talk a lot about how they're smaller, um, how they might be more discussion based. But since all of you actually teach these courses, I thought you would have a better sense of what they're typically like. Um, so to start, I'll call on a few people to kind of hear some views on this. Uh, so John, would you tell me a little bit more about what a typical RC course is like? Well, uh, I think you should start, uh, as you said, with the, the small class size, uh, because again, at a place uh, like Michigan, which has 30 to 35,000 students, uh, there are a number of classes that you're probably going to be experiencing in your first and second year. Uh, where you'll be sitting with 500 of your closest friends, you know, in calculus, and nothing like that exists in the in the RC. We don't even have the capacity to have a class that's more than about 50. And as you mentioned at the outset, Logan, most of our classes uh, run in the numbers of um, you know a dozen or so students, and that has a, a, some really significant consequences for the learning process, uh, for student community building. And this is really key, uh, building the in-class relationship with your professor. Uh, because if you're in a large uh, lecture class, it's going to be exceedingly difficult uh, to get to know your professor or for your professor to get to know you. And in a class of a dozen, a dozen students over uh, a semester, uh, it's very easy for everybody to become familiar uh, with each other. And uh, I think, you know, students don't necessarily come into U of M 
thinking about this, but at some point they're going to need recommendation letters uh, wherever they're headed to graduate school or professional school or to a job. Uh, and obviously from the perspective of the professors, it's much easier to write a glowing and uh, detailed recommendation letter uh, with a student uh, with whom you've worked closely. So I think that is, is really key. Uh, I'll just mention quickly uh, the first year seminar uh, classes. So pretty much every student uh, who goes to college takes English composition, right? English uh, Comp 101. Uh, and they have that at Michigan too. But in the RC, we teach college level writing, uh, but with content. So for example, uh, last semester, I taught a course in the history of the American Civil War. And we talked about the Civil War, we read books on the war, we watched films, um, but we were also practicing our writing uh, just like you would in the English composition class. So RC classes tend to be small, they tend to be creative, they tend to be discussion-based and not just sort of passive uh, learning. And, um, you know, I, I think the beauty of the RC is that you get that sort of private liberal arts kind of college feel, but with all of the resources and characteristics of, of a major university. Yeah, and I'd also say that I think something that's very distinctive in RC classes is the amount of independence that our students have in their learning process. Um, I often, if I have a really bright and active student in a class, I will ask them to be my teaching intern for the next time I teach the class. Um, and so they're with me discussing curriculum and changes. And many of my classes are, are constantly breaking into groups, working together, and then presenting their work to the rest of the class. And that works really well for an acting class, a drama class, because obviously um, scene work uh, is you know, only a couple of people. But it's that sense that we're all together in the analytical part of the process. Um, and then you can follow your own creative instincts for your own ex exploration of the material as an artist, as an actor, director, um, and then bring it all together and discuss it with the whole class. So I just think that that's an opportunity you don't really have much of in a very big lecture course. You might have a study group but as far as, as intensive process work with your fellow students, it helps you get to know them very quickly and obviously makes, it, um, makes you as a teacher have a deeper sense of your individual students as leaders and collaborators. I can definitely affirm that as an RC alum, that I was never challenged as much as I was in my RC courses. And it was never as, it was the most collaborative environment. So never in my other courses quite as collaborative. Uh, and I'd like to just kind of take the same Can question. Can I add one oh, yeah, more thing? Absolutely. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Let me, I, I really, I affirm what John and Kate have mentioned. Um, let me mention maybe a couple of other features that to me embody an RC class. One is creative expression, no matter what the subject is. And for example, in my science courses, um, I have students do a lot of writing. And some of it is just reflective writing. Some of it may be commentaries on papers that we're reading. Um, some of it may be a research paper uh, or other various. But we emphasize writing and other forms of creative expression over and over because we feel that it's really important to be able to communicate well. The other thing I'd like to mention is that's a hallmark of many RC classes is that many classes take students out of campus, out of the ivory tower into the world. And some of those are doing that in the fall and winter terms. For example, all of my classes have field trips. Some of them may be on foot to parts of Ann Arbor. Others were getting into vans and going into farms or to natural areas in the western part of the county. And some of my courses even have an uh, international component in which we 
a, a group of the class even goes to another country. And there are many courses that have this kind of component as well. So I'd say that RC courses are very, have one foot in the university and the other foot in the world. Thank you for adding that. That's exactly true, that it's not just uh, stuck in one place. There's a lot of movement that goes on. Uh, so thinking of what an RC course is like and what it's like instructing one, I'd like to hear about that in the COVID world right now, where things have been a lot more virtual. And I'd like to start with Katri, since I saw some really cool photos of you doing some instruction with some of your students. Then, of course, if anyone wants to add afterwards, feel free. Well, it's, you know, the one true thing about Zoom is that you cannot synchronize your time. There is a lag no matter what, almost no matter what. I mean, there are very elaborate technical setups where two people can actually be in synchronicity if they get lucky. But, and of course, in chamber music, that's the one main thing that we're trying to do is to be in synchronicity, in fact, to the level of synchronizing our brain waves. And so um, Zoom has been a challenge in that way, but there are a lot of things that we can do um, and then the things that we can't do, we can find other avenues for. So I've been super lucky to be able to experiment with all of these different platforms. Um, for chamber music specifically, I think what Logan's talking about, we've been able to make recordings in, uh, I, I did a lot of experimenting over summer and I found this, this app that's free it's like a social media thing for music. So students are sending clips of themselves, their own recordings on BandLab. And, um, and uh, so it's, it's kind of exciting actually. And um, you know, it, it had to be one that works on any computer and any telephone and doesn't, or, or cell phone and doesn't need elaborate setup. So it, it's been working out really well. So now you see students in little boxes making those synchronized videos with, with recordings. And that's how we did our, our, um, our um, recital last term and are going to do another one this term. There are also some students who are still playing together. We got a permission to have a limited number of students in one space. I think it's three or four people at a time and they're socially distanced. There's a video camera and a very elaborate setup for me to coach them from afar, but they, they still have access to the, the facility at East Quad. You know, we have a 500 square foot music room and an ensemble practice room and a couple of ensemble piano practice rooms. And of course the Keen Theater where we sometimes perform. So it's been, it's been a challenge, but also a really fun challenge because you know we've been, able to explore other other things but you know you, you you do what you can yeah i hear a lot of the creativity of the rc faculty in addition to kind of that creativity in the community really finding a way to make it work in this uh uh very challenging time we'll say and uh, i wanted to touch on one question and kind of that whole theme of what is typical what's what's most common. So we hear a lot, what is a typical RC student like? And you see these students in your classes and you also will have students that aren't in the RC in your courses for many of those, since they aren't restricted to RC students. Uh, but I'm really curious about, in your opinion, since there isn't one true answer to this, what a typical RC student is like, and especially like to hear from Heather and Jeff, just so we can hear from more of each of you. There, <clears throat> what a typical RC student is like, was that, is that yeah, what you said? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's, there are various. Uh, well, I'll tell you the, the, the most um, fun student to teach, and I think ultimately the most successful student are ones that are willing to take risks and willing to be wrong and not overly, um, uh, anxious about about that. Uh, very interested in learning from from others, and not just from the instructor. Um, interested in interacting with uh, and forming a community of of learners, as um, one of my colleagues has put it, um, in in all courses, not just in 
say, a uh, music ensemble or a theater course, where there's so much interaction um, by nature, but even in uh, a more traditional, you know, sit down in the classroom, read books, talk about uh, and discuss, right? And listen to the occasional brief lecture, um, emphasis on brief. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, students who are really willing to just dive in and uh, are very curious and interested in finding out um, what they don't know as well as what they know. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. And I've had the chance to have a real mix of students because I teach one of the larger classes in the RC. Um, my classes tend to be, I think I've had as many as 50. So I think I've had one of the larger size. I'm, I'm, I'm on the other end of it. And so I have both RC students, but I also get a lot of students that are in the crime and justice minor that come in from maybe their history majors also, or poli sci majors or sociology majors, or sometimes I get students that haven't decided yet. And then they take an RC class and they decide they wanna be a social theory and practice major, uh, or maybe also a crime and justice minor. And so I see a real mix. And what I notice is that the RC students, um, I don't know, to be honest, I think that they seem to have a much more holistic understanding of what we're already doing. Um, they tend to have already taken classes as a as a fresh person that has really integrated the concepts we're doing at the 300 level. So my class is a 300 level and we're talking about crime and justice issues. And I've noticed that my RC students have already been thinking about, they've already read literature that's related to the history, that's related to maybe music that they study, that's related to psychological issues that they've studied. It's kind of a more integrated ed education also. So they seem to, I don't know, they, they're kind of more engaged in, in a way. And I think that the LSNA students kind of pick up on that and they're intrigued by it. And they're also in turn intrigued by the RC. So um, in that sense, I think they're more, I don't know, they seem to be kind of leaders in the classroom, even when it's a mixed, when it's a mixed group of students. Um, the other thing is that they uh, really push the class when it's a mixed group of students to uh, be more creative. So in our classes in the RC, we often bring in guests from the outside. My class often brings in, because it's crime and justice, we bring in often formerly incarcerated people to help co-teach our classes. Uh, we don't just presume that because it's a crime and justice class that because we're the professor, we know everything. We wanna bring people in who've experienced this directly impacted communities. Uh, you know, we feel that they are going to teach students as much about the experience as someone who studied it as long as I have, or we will, um, the students will really be leaders in the workshops that we will do inside of prisons, for example, or um, inside of uh, impacted communities in uh, Washtenaw County, maybe immigrant communities or dealing with immigrant rights or something. So students in the RC tend to be real go-getters in terms of wanting to get into it, not just in the books, but okay, if we're learning about immigrant rights, I wanna get into the community. I wanna do something. I wanna, I wanna figure out how to make a difference. Uh, you know, if there are ice raids in Washtenaw County, I wanna get right in there and figure out how to help people. Or if there's homelessness in Ann Arbor, I wanna figure out how to get in there and do something about it. Or if mass incarceration is a problem, how do I make a difference right now and do something about it? So the, the other real critical thing about the RC is it's very, I don't know, action oriented in a way that we don't uh, insist upon, or it's, it's not even really, it's not, it's not, you don't get five points for doing it on the syllabus, but it tends to be something that students really feel so inspired by what they're learning to 
uh, if they want to translate it into action, there's all kinds of ways in our curriculum to make it happen. So that's also a hallmark of RC students, really integrating their lived experience with their classroom experience. And the RC has all kinds of built in ways to do that. We have a program called Semester in Detroit where the classroom learning experience is integrated with internships that are there. Like you don't have to figure out how to create the internship. Like we have all these relationships that are there. Um, similarly, like I said, the crime and justice um, minor, we have all these relationships. PCAP, the Prison Creative Arts Program, we have all these relationships with um, with correctional facilities so that uh, you can figure out how to become involved and make a difference. Um, you don't have to, but if you want to, those networks are already there so that the that learning in the classroom, learning outside of the classroom is really seamless. And, and that's a real hallmark, hallmark of the students. Uh, it's driven by them is what I'm trying to say. I love that. And I see that where the students see a problem or an issue and they want to get involved and they want to have the conversation and they want the language to know how to approach the problem and it's really amazing watching students identify that in their first year and take that all the way from senior year into career so we have a couple questions coming in through the chat i want to start bringing forward and i'll pose these to the group and anyone would uh, who would like to answer can unmute themselves and answer for this one and we have two that are kind of similar. So one is, what are some benefits of being in the RC other than the community it offers? So if someone's thinking about the RC, what else will they gain beyond the community? And our other question is, what do you think makes the RC the best MLC to join? So I can't technically say it's the best MLC. I will say I'm biased because I am an alum and I also work for the RC. Uh, but I know a lot of students out there are considering the RC and other learning communities. So they might want to wonder, or they might be wondering, why should I pick the RC and what will I gain beyond the community? Well, for one, oh, you gain, me... sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah, you I'll gain the facility, first, right? You go, go first, Catherine. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to mention um, a couple of things and then I'll, I'll hand it to Katri. One is that you're going to get outstanding advising. You'll have literally friends in the academic services office who will be um, helping you every, literally every step of the way in terms of choosing courses, choosing majors, um, understanding the various uh, forms and hoops that you need to, to, uh, to pass through as you, as you make your way through your college experience. And these folks are people you'll, you'll get to know on a first name basis. They're very friendly. They interact a lot with faculty. We really are kind of like a big family and you'll get that ex you'll get that feeling from the day you walk into e squad if you join the rc the other thing i would say compared to other mlcs as a four-year program we are um, able to offer a lot of continuity of, of all the things we've been talking about from your first day in on campus to the day that you graduate and i think those are things that make us distinctive so katri to you now Sorry about that, Catherine. I was going to actually say kind of the same thing. You gain access to the facility, which is rather different than any other facility on campus because of all the things that East Quad has to offer. You have um, arts facilities, you know, you, you can make art in your, where you live, you can make music where you live, you can, you can perform where you live because you, you have a theater. Um, I think it's the only small theater on central campus. Um, and so as an RC student, you don't just gain access to those facilities while you're living at East Quad, but also after you leave, you know, go live somewhere else, you still get to come back. And it's kind of like, then you have two homes on campus um, because you have access to all those things um, that you otherwise, if you weren't, you know, you might not have access to them. I was going to mention languages, but Heather, did you want to say something first? Yeah, when I was going to mention both the languages and also the facility. I mean, I think what we keep saying the facility, but we can't really stress enough. Like, first of all, it's the best dorm you can live in. Let's just be frank. 
it's like just the, the facility itself is just the this a beautiful beautiful building with all of the things that everyone is mentioning centrally located a perfect spot to be in even if the rc wasn't there i think everyone would want to live there uh, but the fact that the rc is there is really a blessing and you know it is just everything Katri said I mean you're walking down the halls you hear the piano you hear you know especially when COVID is gonna is is lifting which it will especially as everyone is vaccinated and we all get back to, to normal I think it's just got so much life in it and a lot of the other dorms they kind of they kind of shut down at night the RC never shuts down I mean no matter what time it is there are people there there's an art gallery there there's just stuff always going on and that sense of kind of life is very warm and welcoming when you're when you're new to campus and you know people feel homesick sometimes it's just normal they're feeling like they need a little community that stuff goes well beyond your learning community that's well beyond your little pod you're in that just kind of that feeling is always there and even when you might move out um that country's right you feel like that you want to come back to that you kind of you feel like that's always there for you and i think notably even for students that have later on uh chosen different majors um they wanted to keep a foot in the rc you know they've wanted to keep that one class a semester to still stay in the rc to still graduate with the rc because that's the kind of connective tissue it has and even the language which you know, people have been nervous about, I think, because it's like, oh, it's so intensive. You know, it's funny, um, everyone's got to take a language in LSNA. Well, in the RC, you know, you get to just be right there. It's just literally right there. And it's and it's a family. So you're used the same community that you're taking it with. So it's either that or, you know, four days away, clear across the campus with, you know, a TA that you may or may not know. So it's again, that kind of closeness. And I think it's hard to underestimate that, not just in one theme, but in all of your classes. That's a very yeah. unusual thing about an MLC, I think. Yeah, I mean, the RC is really unusual and perhaps even unique uh, in terms of the MLCs in regard to language um, instruction. So all students uh, who come in in their first year will effectively uh, take four semesters of a language in two semesters. So the LSNA requirement is uh, four semesters. We condensed that into the intense format into two semesters. And, um, you know, although as Heather said, that can be a bit intimidating sometimes for students, uh, it's also uh, amazingly adept and the track record is there uh, with uh, getting students to proficiency in a language in just a year. I mean, that's the immersion nature of the program. And um, uh, our daughter is in the RC. So uh, I'm Mr. Heather Thompson. So Heather and I are married. Uh, uh, we, can, we can sort of personally attest that our daughter uh, is in the RC. And, you know, within a year, she went from very limited understanding of Spanish to being pretty confident and pretty uh, proficient in the language. And our students uh, have a higher rate of a proficiency in the language exam uh, in the RC than the general LSNA population does. So that's one of the distinguishing, perhaps one of the most distinguishing aspects of the RC uh, experience and why the RC, in addition to all of the other things people have talked about, is in some ways uh, the best MLC to join. And I'd say too that you don't leave your language knowledge at your last class. There are the community collaborations that Logan mentioned where you can uh, do tutoring to the Haitian community in French. There's a Spanish language internship program where you can work with a number of, um, of organizations and a range of ages and experiences of people. Um, and so you, you can carry it with you plus we emphasize a lot of um, foreign study, foreign projects. So to go away for a summer or a semester or a year. Um, 
and and I think that the the sense that it's not just a requirement that you have to get through, but it's a community of scholars and people that you're having language lunches, you're having coffee hours, you're you know, you're engaging with the language on a, a very regular basis. And I would say the same thing for drama, that the RC Players is a wonderful, um, you know, it's a fertile ground for people who are interested in theater, even if they've just taken one course. I wanted to say, I think something that distinguishes us is um, last semester I had a really talented freshman and I, he was in an acting class and I said, you think like a director, I'd like you to take the directing class next semester. But that's a 400 level course. And he had just taken a freshman level course. Well, that doesn't happen really easily in LSNA. But it's the fact that we get to know these students and we see what kind of challenges they should undertake for themselves. I mean, obviously they have to want to, but he's doing brilliantly and he's also directing for RC players as a freshman. So, and that's not an unusual story. It really isn't. Plus the food is really good in a squad. <laughs> I think it, it's always it, a good selling feature as well. <laughs> it's a very important selling feature. It didn't used to be so good and it is really good now. So <laughs> well, thank you all. And I appreciate hearing especially these unique advantages and opportunities you can get by being part of the program. But also I just want to recognize that a lot of you mentioned things about the RC that aren't part of your direct departments which really gives RC more of that small liberal arts college feel. The faculty are really connected. They really know what's going on in these other areas, that it's more holistic in that way. So it's not just that you're sent off to some department somewhere else on campus. It is a whole big community effort. So I know some of you mentioned kind of the rigor of the courses or kind of the structure of those. And we did have a question come in saying, do you ever see students struggle with the rigor of courses? And I know some of this could be broader for Michigan, kind of that Michigan standard and how that's pretty common to struggle in your first semester. But I'd be curious kind of how that shows up in smaller courses. So do you notice it sooner? What are some things that you've seen happen? If anyone would like to share more about that. Well, maybe I'll speak up a little bit about my experience in first year seminars. John mentioned those earlier, and I teach one usually about every other year. And I would say that one way that we as faculty are able to help students who are struggling is because we have a lot of contact with students individually. For example, we usually hold a lot of office hours. I typically meet with all my students in a first year seminar at least six times over the semester, sometimes more. And during those individual meetings, there's a lot of chance both for, you know, to discuss the assignment in front of us, but also to find out how you are doing, how you, the student, are doing. Are, are you struggling with anything? Are there some things that are presenting special difficulties to you? And I'm interested in that not only in my class, but in other parts of their undergraduate experience as well. So that if there's something else that's that they're struggling with, I might be able to offer a suggestion, well, why don't you talk to so-and-so? Um, whether it's um, for just a little bit of academic advising, we have very good mental health support on campus. And um, I think students simply knowing there's somebody who's not non-judgmental and supportive who will listen and uh, in an open-mindedly is, is, can be very helpful. I think you've got a great sense of it. And I always can speak to my own experience when I struggled in RC courses, my instructors noticed. I didn't feel like I was lost in the crowd. And the fact that they could recommend someone by name, talk to so-and-so makes a big difference. Um, we've had a question come in saying, does being in the RC look good when graduating from U of M and applying to jobs? I know it came up earlier too about being able to reach out for those letters of recommendation. So there's a couple ways where RC students look a little different on their transcript, kind of those narrative evaluations or the proficiency. 
So some ways where they kind of are set apart or may look good when they're applying. Would anyone like to talk about kind of RC students moving forward into careers or just the way that they kind of set themselves up to be a little bit more competitive? Well, let me just briefly say that some of my students have told me specifically that having narrative evaluations made a huge difference as far as getting into a graduate program, a competitive graduate program, because they knew a lot more than just a grade. And we give narrative evaluations to all RC students on all RC courses. And, um, and then it's also, you know, when a student contacts you five years later and asks for a letter of recommendation, you can go back to those evaluations and you have somewhere to start. Um, but I think it makes a huge difference. And the initiative that they take always counts in any kind of uh, further academic training or job that they're not just sitting in the back of the room, that they're, they're fully engaged and they take on leadership roles. That's very important. And I want to be sensitive to our time because we're getting close to the end here. So one question I want to give a chance for everyone to answer is what piece of advice would you give to a student if they're considering joining the RC? So kind of this incoming class, it's been a much more unusual year this past year, but they're considering Michigan. Maybe they're looking at multiple MLCs. What would you tell that student? Uh, one thing is to check your email um, and read your email. So that would be really helpful. Um, you know, a lot of our, our students, of course, uh, think that um, emails for old people like their parents or their professors, uh, but in fact, that's the main way through which uh, we communicate with the students. But uh, on a more serious note, I would just say, I think students are often intimidated, uh, unnecessarily so, by coming to talk with their professors. And, um, you know, it's not like, you know, we, we know that you're 18 years old. We know that you're 19 years old. We're not expecting you to write, you know, Shakespeare. We're not expecting you to, to uh, come up with a cure for cancer in your first three months on campus. So, you know, even if it's just something about, um, you know, your own experiences in a particular subject or a tough time you're having with a test or a book that you're reading or an article that you came across, uh, a lot of the times, to be quite honest, uh, professors sit in office hours and um, oftentimes very few students or in fact, no students uh, in, are arriving. So I would encourage all the students uh, to make it a point to connect with your professors during office hours via email and um, you know, get, help them to get to know you a little bit because uh, that's, again, an important way that they're going to be on your side, right? I mean, they're going to be a, an ally for you. They're going to potentially be a mentor for you. And in a practical sense, uh, be a reference letter uh, writer for you down the line. So uh, the more that, um, you know, you, you make yourself known and the more that um, you put yourself out there a little bit in terms of uh, taking, taking the chance uh, to meet with professors during office hours, that's all going to benefit you. Um, and, and don't be intimidated and don't be worried or anxious about it because we're glad to see you in office hours because otherwise we're sitting there doing email. <laughs> yes, everyone, please remember this, that your instructors want to see you. And especially in the RC, we call our instructors by their first names. So it's much more inviting and casual. So really welcome that opportunity. And Jeff, I'd like to pass it your way. If there's any advice or anything you'd like to say to those students considering joining the RC. Yeah, originally you said comparing to other MLCs. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's well, do your homework, I guess, is probably the, the, uh, the basic thing is to find out what, what uh, these various programs are really like and, um, and what kinds of opportunities there are. And I think, uh, I can't speak for those other programs. I just know that, that our um, faculty and students tend to work very closely together and faculty really welcome, um, welcome interruptions. <laughs> and 
welcome you to to uh, contact them to do what John had has been saying. Any range of things from, gee, I find this to be interesting. What do you think? Um, this is not an introduction. This is not unwelcome. This is this is great, great stuff. And uh, so. Find, try and get a sense from other MLCs of what kinds of relationships there are um, among, among students, but also between students and faculty. And, uh, and I guess, you know, talking to uh, uh, students who are already involved might be a really good way to find out just what the milieu is like, what's the, what's the atmosphere. And on that note, too, I'll also drop a link in the chat uh, for some upcoming RC events where you can connect more with uh, current students. We also had a panel like this of current students we saved. So you can go hear a little bit more about those experiences. And just briefly, because we're running short on time, Katri, is there anything you'd like to share? I would say that don't let any one thing be a deterrent because RC students, there's you have a lot of control over your own destiny and you can, you know, you can chart your path a lot, even though there are requirements, you know, there, you know, there are many options for filling those requirements. One student just asked in the, in the Q and A or the chat uh, about, you know, they're studying Arabic. So is that going to be an impediment to uh, being part of that RC community? And the answer is no, in large part because of the first year seminars that all incoming RC students are required to take. So the first uh, in the fall semester, you'll be taking um, you know, your language perhaps outside of the RC, but you'll still have the first year seminar uh, with a dozen or so other students in the RC. You'll still be living in East Quad with RC students. And um, you, know, you could easily pick another class or two in the RC in East Quad. So uh, I don't think that's gonna be a hindrance to your ability to, to be part of that community. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we are the oldest or among the oldest uh, residential learning uh, programs in the country and were founded in the late 60s, 67, as a place where students could take back their education. It was really created as a response to what they saw as a machine producing students uh, and students were at the center of everything. The government structure of the RC was students and faculty together. And I've been here 30 years and you heard from a number of my colleagues that we've been here for a long time. What keeps us here? It's the fact that it's eternally new and we, we can grow as creative people, as teachers, as learners. And I think that says a lot that um, our focus is on undergraduate teaching. Mm -hmm. And even if we're tenured and writing books and doing a lot of other work. We love teaching undergraduates. That's the strongest call to us. And that is really important. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, and let me add a couple of things about, you know, what you might, who might be considering coming here. If you are really curious and adventurous about your education, and you want some earnest discussion as well as experience in activities that will help to change the world, I would recommend the residential college. <laughs> I think that sums it up really well. And Heather, is there anything else that you would like to share? No, I mean, I think everyone has said it beautifully. Just, you know, you can tell from everybody on this call that um, we talk with each other a lot about how to make the RC a welcoming place. We even throughout COVID, we as a group met a lot together to make sure that the students still felt connected to us and to each other. And 
and to the community that was the RC. And I think that should send you the biggest vote of confidence that if you come here, you'll feel part of a very warm community that is going to put your education and uh, and uh, your interests uh, at Michigan first. And that's probably the biggest vote of confidence as to why this is the uh, learning community that will make your, your education uh, really front and center. And that's really, I think this is it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you everyone. And this is a unique opportunity in general for students to be able to connect with faculty in this way, especially during COVID. But this is a taste of what it would be like in the, when you're in the RC, having one-on-one -on -one interactions with faculty members, running into them in the hall, really having that genuine student-centered education. So that concludes our presentation where you have a chance to connect with our faculty members. As I mentioned, we have one more RC Intros event coming up next month with our alumni. So you can hear more about their experiences, how it translated into their career path. Uh, but for the rest of this evening, I will close our Zoom call. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly with any questions and have a good evening. Thank you for coming, everyone.